The title of our message is Kneel Before the Father, and it is from chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. So we've been traveling through the book of Ephesians. We're getting past the introductory comments, and now we're getting to a passage this morning where Paul is going to be praying for the Ephesians, and he's going to be telling some of his credentials, so to speak. So let's pray together, and then let's, let's start to look into God's Word this morning. Father, thank you so much for this time where we can come together and hear your Word proclaimed and expect that you are going to encounter us in a very powerful way. Father, we thank you that we have the ability to come together and to gather as your believers as your church here at Eastside. Father, I pray that this morning that these words that come from you would accomplish what you have intended and that I would not be a hindrance to your message this morning. Dear Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Paul has been telling his readers about who they are as the church so far in this letter. And now he's going to tell a little bit about himself and the reason for his ministry. And he also prays for those to whom he is writing, or for the churches that this letter is going out to. And that's really probably not a surprise, or maybe perhaps actually it is a surprise. Perhaps the surprise is that Paul's purpose in ministry is directed towards the people to which he is writing. In other words, the Gentiles. Because that is a major shift in the way that the Jewish people in particular understood their relationship to God. Paul is going to tell us today that he's a slave or a servant to Christ for the benefit of the Gentiles. He is to make known what was expected only for the Jew, that it's going to be available for the Gentiles also. If you'll join with me as we look at chapter 3, starting in verse 1 of the book of Ephesians. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, For the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Paul is sent to the Gentiles. In the past, God has mostly sent people to the Jewish nation, to His own people. And the Gentiles were not included in that. And so we see as the the general attitude that has developed is that the Jews are the special people and the Gentiles are the pagans. Everybody else, uh, God really doesn't love them. He really doesn't care for them. God's special people are the Jewish people. People. And Paul is saying that now he has been sent specifically to the Gentiles. He didn't just have a message or have a mission that was sent to the Jews. And then if you, enter, if you encounter some Gentiles or if you run into some or if some of them want to talk to you, you can share with them as well. No, Paul is telling us that his mission, his purpose in being sent by God is to be a messenger, an apostle to the Gentiles. And God has given Paul the grace to minister to the Gentiles. Paul is a messenger to share with them all of the Gentiles that are being incorporated into the church through the efforts of Paul his outreach ministries, his missionary journeys, these churches owe to Paul the debt of him sharing with them the mystery of Christ or the ability to know Jesus. Paul tells us in this part of the passage, the mystery of Christ was withheld from previous generations and revealed to the prophets and apostles by the Holy Spirit. And for whatever reason, and we've 
touched on this in a couple other places before, God did not share what he was going to do. And he did not send Jesus at an earlier time. He sent them at the time when everything was just in the right place. And we don't necessarily know exactly what it being the, the fullness of time and being everything being set up the way God wanted it. We don't know exactly what that means. But God kept hidden from earlier peoples what he was going to do. But now he has made it known. It is being shared now by the Holy Spirit with the prophets and the apostles through their ministry. And note that Paul tells us what this mystery is. Now he, he says, the, he mentions the mystery and, and sometimes we get caught up in wanting to know, oh, what's this hidden thing that we can find out? What's the mystery here? Do we have to figure out what the mystery is? The good news in this passage is that Paul, go, he tells us the mystery and then he tells us what that mystery is. The mystery is that the Gentiles are also heirs to the promise with Israel. Paul has been mentioning that God is bringing together the two people to make one body. And that this mystery was withheld. God is bringing everyone together in Christ, but no longer is that mystery hidden. And no longer will there be a division in the world of those who are God's special people and others that can't access that. Now, because of Jesus, that ability to be part of God's family, to be part of God's people, is available. And everyone can be reconciled to God in Christ. So Paul is telling about this mystery. Let's pick up in verse 7 and continue. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make plain to everyone the administration of his mercy, of this mercy, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Paul acknowledges in this portion of the passage that he is God's servant by God's grace. We know Paul was, was a really interesting and probably a fairly extraordinary person. He had citizenship in Israel, he was born as a Jew, but he also, because of circumstance, he also had citizenship in Rome. We know that he was educated. He was well educated in the traditions of the Jewish people, but he also had some education in Roman or more secular, if you will, type of learning as well. And so Paul is a, a pretty pretty interesting fellow. He's He's got some important education. He's got some position. And what does he say about the fact that God is sending him to the Gentiles? He does not say, it's because I was so prepared that God sent me to the Gentiles. He doesn't say it was because I was so well positioned or because of these things that I had done to get myself in the right position that God sent me to the Gentiles. No, he says that in verse 7, I became servant of this gospel. How? By the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of His power. Paul realizes that it is undeserved. It is simply because God chose to use him in this way that he was able to serve. It's not because Paul had made himself into something. It's because God had decided, I'm going to use Paul. And Paul is to preach the riches of Christ to the Gentiles, the wonderful benefits of being in Christ, being part of the church, having the 
relationship with God, being part of God's family. Those are the things that Paul is to preach. And not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And the wisdom of God, Paul tells us, is made known to the church now. And as examined on different occasions, we don't know why God would wait until that point. We could speculate maybe it was because of Alexander the Great and his conquest of the ancient world and his spreading of the Greek language and the Greek culture so that people had a common language to share and common stories to, to share. We could speculate for that, that it could have been the reason. But we may never know for sure. What we do know is that God kept this well hidden until it was revealed in Christ. God had kept it disguised, and that lets us know a couple of things. One, that people didn't figure out what God was doing. Beyond that, and I think more important, is that the church, Jesus' sacrifice, the establishment of the church as God's people was not a backup plan. God had intended it from the beginning, but He didn't tell everybody what He was going to do. He had intended it from the beginning that Jesus would die for our sins, would make a way for us to be reconciled back to God, and that the church would be God's people and God's expression of His grace on earth. And He had planned this way back before He even created the universe. But He kept it hidden. So I think it's important for us to, to remember that just because as we look at history and we see, well, God did some things here and He did some more things here and He did some more things here and then Jesus came and then there's been some more things going on and, and time is progressing on that somehow God started things off one direction and then had to change His plans and say, well, that didn't really work out very well. Now we have to do that, right? We work on things and, and we make plans and we start projects and and we have grand ideas you just ask Emily I have all these grand ideas floating around in my head most of them are just stay up there but occasionally we may start on a project of some sort and it goes for a little while and maybe it doesn't turn out the way we think it will or life turns us in another direction God is is moving putting something in our path that that changes our plans and so we have to change plans but the church is not an afterthought the church was God's plan from before He created the universe at all. Just because we didn't know about it until now when Paul is writing, Paul is saying God kept that hidden. He didn't let everybody know what He was going to do. He kept it hidden until it was revealed in Christ. And of course, as we understand the church, we know that means that we are adopted into God's family. We are justified. We are progressing in sanctification to become more like Jesus. And there's a, there's, for us as the church, there's a lot that we need to do. But one of the things, as Paul mentioned last week, that we have by being in the church is that we can approach God. We can come into God's presence through Christ. And our coming to God is with confidence, as he says today, and freedom because of our position in Christ. We have a special relationship with God because of Jesus and his life and death and what that has done for us being adopted into God's family. Last week, the passage talked about having access to God, and we said that that was awesome, that we had access to the Creator of the universe. But not only do we have access, we have the ability to approach God with confidence and freedom. Access to God in the Old Testament was controlled by the sacrificial system, but that's no longer the case. We don't have to come through the sacrifices and through the offerings of the priest. We can come to God boldly and with confidence because we are His. Now think about this for a moment. In our country, the most powerful person is the president, right? The, most, the leader of our country is the president. And if you want to get an audience with the president, there has to be something special enough about you that you can get an audience with the president. But even if you do get an audience with the president, you're going to have to pass through all these layers of security and they're going to check you out and all of those kind of things. But a couple of people that don't have to deal with that are the president's children, right? They don't have to go request to have an audience with the president. They can go just approach their daddy with confidence. Why? Is it because they're that important? Is it because they're so powerful? 
It has nothing to do with what they can do. It has everything to do with who they are. They have a relationship with the president where he is their father. And they don't ever have to worry about being turned away or trying to petition and get permission to come into their father's presence and church. That is the position we have in Jesus Christ with the father. We don't have to be concerned about offering a proper sacrifice and trying to get on the calendar so that we can get a a date. We are adopted into his family. We are his children and we can come like a child comes to a father confidently and boldly with freedom because of who we are in Christ. And that's not because of what we've done. That's because of what Jesus has done and the grace that has been given to us that has adopted us into God's family and made us co-heirs with Christ and made us part of God's family. And so we have that freedom to approach God with confidence. And that's pretty exciting. That is pretty exciting, the fact that these barriers, and and to these people Paul is writing to, they, from a Jewish standpoint, they, they had no business being interested in God, because God was the God of the Jews. He was the God of the Hebrew people. But Paul is saying now, those distinctions are going away. There's going to be one group of people that are God's people, and that's the church. Paul tells the church not to be discouraged by his own sufferings, by the sufferings that he has to endure. And note he says that those sufferings are for their benefit. It's for them, and they are a glory for them, His sufferings. We're going to talk about that in just a few moments, but let's continue in verse 14 and go on for the next few verses. Paul writes, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom His whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with the power through His Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul is praying for the people he is writing this letter to, and they are Gentiles primarily. And note that Paul is praying for specific things. He prays that they would be strengthened, inner strength through the Spirit. Paul prays that they would be indwelt by Christ through faith. Paul prays that they would have power to grasp the dimensions of Christ's love, and and he uses how wide and long and high and deep. And that these dimensions or the scale, how big this love is, surpasses knowledge. It's bigger than we can comprehend. He also prays that they would be filled with the fullness of God. Now, I think it's interesting. We're going to camp here for a little bit. I think it's very interesting, church, that Paul has just noted in the the verse right that we left off of, he said, I'm suffering But don't be concerned about that. It's for your benefit and for your glory. And then he starts to pray for these people. And so Paul is suffering. He's suffering for them and for their glory. And what does Paul pray for? He prays that this church will have inner strength, indwelling by Christ, that they will have knowledge of the love of Christ, and they will be filled with the fullness of God. Those are the things that apparently are important to Paul at this point that he's going to pray for them that they would have these benefits. It's interesting. When we look at that, we don't see anything about having lots of money coming to them. Uh, We don't see anything about making it so that they are not suffering. We don't see anything about having all these blessings flow this way. No, Paul is praying that they will be strengthened inner strength through the Spirit and dwelt by Christ, that they will understand Christ's love and they'll be filled with the fullness of God. Church, what do we pray for when we're suffering? When we're going through difficult times or when we're suffering because someone we love is going through difficult times, what do we pray for? Do we pray 
that others will get closer to God and to one another. When I'm hurting, when I'm suffering, where am I directing my prayers and what am I requesting? And we pray a lot together, and we should, and we ought to pray more with with and for one another. And it's certainly fine for us to pray for God to alleviate suffering, to provide things that are needed. But church, Paul is suffering. Paul is writing to this church. And look at the things that he asks for. Do we even pray, aside from when we're suffering, do we even pray for these type of things for ourselves? I know we pray for, again, we pray for safety. We pray for healing. We pray for material needs. But Paul is praying for these Christians to have inner strength. Jesus indwelling them. Understanding how big Christ's love is and filling of God. And I'm afraid we may be so distracted and caught up on other things that the priorities Paul is praying for here that we don't see them as such a big deal. Do we really think that understanding how magnificent Jesus' love is for us is that big of a deal that we really need to contemplate it or think about it or pray that other people will understand it? I'm afraid we've reduced the conception of what God has done to us, for us and to us to something that is, is just like another option maybe in a, in a supermarket or in the S&S when you go in there and, and they've got all these different options and you kind of pick the things that you want. Do we understand how magnificent, the, how, how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is for us? Paul seemed to think that was really important. He seemed to think it was much more important than the fact that you would have money or that you would have food or all these other things that he's not mentioning or good health. The idea that we would have strength and inner strength through the Spirit. That we would be indwelt by Christ. That we would be filled with the fullness of God. And understand the, the vastness of Christ's love seems to be much more important to Paul here than his own suffering. Now church, have we really missed some of the important things that we should be praying for if we are not asking God for ourselves and for others, for the things that Paul has requested here for the churches that he is writing this letter to. We really need to think about that. We, we, we pray for things and we should pray. I'm not saying that anything that we are asking God for is something we shouldn't ask God for, but I'm saying should we not limit it to simply physical things. We pray for healing. We need healing. We've got a lot of sick people. God needs to heal them. Pray that God will heal them. But if we're only praying for their physical healing, have we not gone far enough? We've got people who have financial need or have other relational needs and those are important and they're real and we need to pray for them. But if we don't pray that they will understand the magnificence of Christ's love, if if we don't pray that they'll be filled with God's presence, have we failed To pray as we should. If we're only praying for the things that we can see. These tangible things that we can touch and taste. And see and feel and smell. And those kind of things. If that's what we're praying for. And we neglect to pray for strengthening in the Spirit. To being indwelt by Christ. To understanding the fullness of of Christ's love. And to being filled with the fullness of God. Have we neglected to pray for greater things also. So when we pray, church, let's not just focus on the things that are right in front of our eyes, but let's focus on the things that Paul was focusing on as well. That we would become more grateful, more understanding of who God is. That we would have an insight. We would see the need that is beyond what is in front of us in this world. But the ultimate realization of the important things of our growing in faith and being the church together. Let's continue with verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul closes this section praising God. And church, I think that's a great pattern for us to to copy. It's a great to emulate what Paul is doing to do the kind of things when we 
pray, we need to make sure we praise God. And, and that's a good example for Paul to show us here. But what do we do with this word from Paul this morning? You know, it's, it's an interesting passage. Paul is praying and, and he's telling us about himself and his mission. And, and so when we start to look for application here, you know, we kind of have to, to look around and see, well, you know, what do we take from this? What can we see that Paul is, is writing here? Because he's trying to encourage this church and, and these churches that are, it's being written, the letter is being written to. But what do we do with it? And I think that there's a couple of things. One is we need to realize how awesome it is to be reconciled to God. I think the idea that the barriers that separated the Jewish people from the Gentiles, understanding those barriers have now been torn down and that we can be heirs to the promise as well. And in fact, if it wasn't for that, then we wouldn't have any hope in being heirs to the promise. That is one of the important things we should not miss from this passage. And we need to realize, if not for what Jesus has, had done, we would not have access to God. We wouldn't even have had the, the access through the sacrificial system of the Old Testament because probably most of us were not don't have any Jewish blood in our in our history we certainly if your mother was not jewish then you're not jewish so we wouldn't have had access to god even through the old covenant praise god for that and and praise jesus for what he's done because he's made salvation he's made relationship with god possible for us but i think the main thing that we need to focus on are paul's priorities for believers in his prayer in the the last part of this chapter Paul prays for, as we've mentioned a couple times already, inner strength, Jesus to indwell the church, the people, an understanding of how big Christ's love is, and to be filled with God. I think the challenge for us today is to ask ourselves whether we really want to seek these things or if we want to seek other things. Paul thought these were important, and I think what we need to ask ourselves is how are we doing in praying for these things, and how are, how are we doing in understanding these things? Do we realize how magnificent and massive God's love is? Do we have strength, inner strength? Are we filled with Christ? Have the Spirit indwell us and, and are empowered through that? And are we filled with, with God's power? And if we aren't, then the question I have for us is, will we kneel before the Father and ask for these things? Let us pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask for your blessing on this time that we have, that we have had. Father, I pray that we would, as Paul prayed for these churches, that we would seek to know the things that Paul thought was important. We do praise you for every blessing, material blessings, physical blessings, our health. And we pray for those who have need there. But Father, we pray for the things that are also important that are beyond those. We pray that you will fill us. We pray that we will understand the magnificence and the scale of your love for us. We pray that we'll be indwelt by Christ. And we pray for that strength. And I pray for the church to have these things at East Side. And I pray for our sister churches and other Christians in this community in Lake City to have these things that Paul has mentioned this morning through your word, that these things would be obtained by your people here in Lake City. That we could start to be your people with power again. That we could be revived and renewed and empowered to share your gospel in ways that are maybe different from what we're used to, but that in ways that those who need to hear will give an audience, will listen, and that you will gloriously save them. Father, we give this time to you and we pray that you would help us to focus on the things that are the best. Not just on things that are good, but things that are the best. Dear Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and we give you this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen.